So the new release model. Mm -hmm. So we used to have a feature driven and now we've switched to a time bound. So when you're designing software, you could either figure out ahead of time what were the features that were coming out in the next release and then uh, sort of estimate the time. And But if you were not ready, you usually kicked it out or you know trimmed out some of the features. The new model, on the other hand, we have a fixed time. We're going to release on a particular date. And rather than trying to guess ahead of time or estimate which features will go in, mm -hmm. we work on the features, if you will, on side projects. And when they're ready, they get assigned to a release. So you know, this is what it looked like. We used to have these releases that theoretically were going to come out every two years and would be supported for a very long time. So now at the beginning of those two years, towards the front part, we had what we call update releases. So when the release was still the most current one, mm -hmm. we would produce an update release approximately every six months. So if we had kept the old model, you know, we did this for eight. We did 8U20, which was about six months after eight, then six months after that, 8U40, six months after that, 8U60. And theoretically, we were going to have JDK9 six months after 8U40. But as I said before, when you have a feature-driven release and the feature isn't ready, what do you do? You know, you end up delaying the release. Mm -hmm. which is kind of painful. And it's a pain because there were a bunch of other features coming out on JDK 9, some of which were ready well ahead of time and mm -hmm. could have come out six months after JDK 8. But you know, without the signature feature, they didn't have a release vehicle to come out on. Right. Now, when you look at this, we thought about it and we said, we already have a theoretical release every six months, mm -hmm. right? We had 9, then we were going to do 9.1, 9.2, and 9.3, and then after that, we were going to do 10. Now, if you do it using the previous model, where update releases do not have a revision of the specification, you could only do certain changes. And we said, wh why do we want to constrain it? Why do we want to keep it so that you can only get, for example, changes to the spec every two years? Now. People think, oh, change the spec. That's very scary. That must be a major change, right? Mm -hmm. But you also need to rev the spec, for example, if you want to give you if you want to give users the next version of Unicode. And that's not that scary, right? Right. So we decided, okay, let's forget about dot releases and update releases, and let's just have a feature release every six months. We cannot support a feature release every six months for a very long time. Luckily, this is a problem that has already been solved. We borrowed from certain Linux distributions. And what we said is some of them we're going to call long-term support. And the others are just not long-term support. Now, the next question after that is, of course, how often will you Do a make a release be you know, an LPS? Right. And you know, there's, of course, questions. And depending on who you ask, it could be, well, we want an LTS every year. Um, you go to some large companies that don't want to switch LTSs and they're like, every five years is fine, right? Uh, we decided, well, what's the average time that we used to have a major release on? And it's about three years. So we said, okay, let's open with an LTS every three years. This is not retroactive, so all of the previous commitments remain as they were, seven, eight, and, not, you know, and, and six, 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 seven, and eight, just continue with their previous dates. Okay. But from now on, we're going to have non-LTS releases, mm -hmm. you know, the standard releases, and every now and then, every three years, an LTS. Now, there's some some other changes that came along. Right. OK, so, so yes, yeah, so OpenJDK binaries. OpenJDK binaries from Oracle. OK, so, so yeah, what, what does it mean? What does that mean? <laughs> Up until JDK 8, mm -hmm. Oracle did what many others do, which is you do most of the development of the JDK in OpenJDK in the open. But then at the time of release, you grab that code from the open source and you sprinkle on some other commercial features and other closed code. And that allows us to offer some additional functionality that's not available in OpenJDK. 
and that was a commercial feature from Oracle. If you wanted to use that functionality, you had to license the Oracle JDK. You couldn't go and grab an open JDK build and expect that, that functionality to be there. Now, um, I don't know about the exact numbers, but you know, round guess, about 95% of the functionality was the same. The other 5% was these extra additional features. That's all well, right? But when you now have a release that has to keep in sync with OpenJDK, mm -hmm. any delta means more work. And we also figured, you know what? These commercial features, they're not being as adopted because people are afraid to try them out because what happens if I like them and now I have to pay for them, right? <laughs> <laughs> we figured, okay, let's keep things simple. Everything in the open. So we grab those commercial features and we open source them. Mm -hmm. And now that we no longer have this difference, now we can finally achieve you know, a particular goal of ours, which was, okay, now we can just have an open JDK binary. And if you grab an open JDK binary, all of the source, it, it's built from source code exclusively uh, in open JDK. Yep. And now we really don't need these commercial features and non-commercial features. So we, we announced that that was what we were planning to do f with JDK 9 right before the release of JDK 9. But of course, that meant that JDK 9 didn't have those commercial features in it yet. Uh, it takes a while to open source features. It's not just a matter of cutting and pasting it from close to open. Right. You have to go and make sure that, for example, you have the right licenses for the third party components that that open source code will now use. Mm -hmm. And you need to you know, clean up the code and make sure that it's to the level expected in OpenJDK. So it takes a while. We were not done with JDK 10 either. We were done with JDK 11. So, so and you have the list of, oh yeah, okay. So, so yep. here's where we go, right? Uh, the blue boxes, the yep. dark blue boxes represent our open JDK binaries. We said, starting with JDK 9, we're going to offer not only the Oracle JDK binaries, which included these commercial features, mm -hmm. but also open JDK binaries built exclusively from source code from OpenJDK. Now, in 9, there were a list. We open sourced, actually, I think just one of those commercial features for 10. But by the time we reached JDK 11, we've now created virtually interchangeable binaries. Mm -hmm. And you can use either, and there is no difference in functionality. There's still some minor difference, which you know, um, we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. But for all intents and purposes, they're now the same binary. So now that we have two binaries that are interchangeable, we decided let's make things clear. Open JDK binaries under GPL, those you know, are not a commercial product, they're GPL. Go mm -hmm. grab them, use them for anything you want. And now the Oracle JDK binaries will be under Oracle standard, term, standard terms. So if you want to use those in production, you need to license that. You need to, you, well, all software is licensed. You need to purchase a product that offers you the license to use that in production. And then you have the support with it, obviously. Right, so the right. next question is, well, if they're interchangeable, right. What's the why difference? would right. anybody <laughs> in their right mind pay right. for, for something, something that's exactly the right. same as one in OpenJDK? Right. The functionality is the same, mm -hmm. the difference is how many updates will you receive on that version? So you see the red bars at the bottom. Those are the Oracle JDK LTS releases. Oracle will continue making updates to JDK 11 for, you know, according to this graph, somewhere until the middle, actually it's September of 2026, eight years. So if you, you know, I'm just gonna rewrite this. Another way of seeing this is open JDK binaries. We always have the latest version available. Oracle JDK, we have the same latest version available, but we also offer long-term support so that if you're an enterprise that needs to stay and you go for, you know, I, I just want stability. I don't want new functionality. I just want the same thing to continue working for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Then you will continue to get updates to JDK 11 for a very long time. Right. So for yes. For so mission critical uh, c uh, software, for example, well for big companies. Well, I mean, mission so critical software that cannot keep up to date because right. let's not be confused. Mm, you can sure. use Open JDK binaries right. on mission critical software mm -hmm. as long as you have uh, a deployment model and uh, a process that will allow you to keep up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's more about 
can use, do you need to stay on a version for longer right. than six months? Right. If that's okay. the case, then we and, and other vendors offer long-term support for those versions. Perfect. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. The other difference is support. If you find a bug in OpenJDK, yes, you can go online and file a bug. Right. But you cannot call and demand that an engineer spend the next, you know, don't go to sleep until you give me an answer on this one. If you want to call somebody, you need to have support. Mm -hmm. That's in Oracle, that's in Oracle JDK, not in OpenJDK. Okay? Yep. So Very clear. What does that mean? We expect that most of the developers out there will go from grabbing the Oracle JDK to grabbing the Open JDK from Oracle. It's available in jdk.java.net. Okay? Yep. Now, what else does this mean? Oh, before I go Th further, right. I said there were some commercial features. People yes. sometimes ask, what were they, right? So here's the complete list. Application class data sharing. That was open source uh, in time for JDK 10. So that was the first previously commercial feature now available to everybody. And for JDK 11, we were working on a project that was never really a commercial feature. It was a research project meant to turn into a commercial feature, mm -hmm. but it turned into a commercial project m meant to, you know, now it's just a, a garbage collection option available to everybody in OpenJDK 2. And we have flight record and mission control, which is a um, diagnostics and profiling tool. Mm -hmm. It's very useful to debug in production. Okay, so the type of bugs that you cannot reproduce while you're running on your IDE, but that you need to have something running, say, two or three months. That kind of bugs that only happen in production, OpenJDK is very, n well, I'm sorry, Flight Recorder is very good at capturing what happened leading to that problem mm -hmm. and letting you pass that on to the developer while you just restart the server and make things work again, right? Now the developer has all the tools to debug it, even though it's a very rare event. That capability was available in Oracle JDK since JDK 7 and before that in JRocket. Now it's available in JDK 11 for everybody. Okay. And Usage Logger, which locally reports what Java was being used on, that's the only feature that's still impending, right? Uh, it's still pending. That's still only available in Oracle JDK. And we haven't yet decided whether we will remove it from Oracle JDK or open source it. So that's TBD. Okay. The end result, though, is same binaries at the end. The other important change in the model is the late binding of features. With JDK 9, we had hundreds of features. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the schedule, you will notice at the top is feature complete in May of 2016 mm -hmm. and GA in September of 2017. <laughs> so that's a long period for stabilizing features. Right? It also meant that we had listed which features were going to go into JDK 9 long before we started, you know, we, we had any, any, any true insight as to what was actually going to be there. And some things were dropped, and a few things were added. And at the end, you know, we came up with this very large, it doesn't fit, so we needed actually two pictures to show the complete list, right? Right. With JDK 10, the first under this new model, you know, whereas before we had, you remember that multi-line list? Now right. we only have 12 JEPs, Java Enhancement Proposals, that were delivered in JDK 10. Now here's the catch. We didn't drop anything. Everything that was added made it into the release. And you know, the trick to do that is, of course, don't add anything until you're pretty sure it's going to be ready. Right. So these six-month releases, they're not going to be the same size as the previous multi-year release. So the rate of innovation, you know, like the, the total number of features that you'll get in two years is about the same. Right. You'll just get them. You know, the latency is smaller, right? right? You, you, some of them you'll get in six months, the next one a year from now, then a year and a half, et cetera. So you don't have to, developers don't have to wait uh, for a small, really be, I mean, small feature um, for two years. I mean, they can get it way Correct. faster if it's ready. Now, th th this doesn't mean that these features were developed within six months, right? right Some of, of these, we've been working on those for a lot longer. Right. This is just, you know, the six months that mark when they're delivered. In the past, every 
major release had mm -hmm. a couple of signature features that were yes. large right. changes. Under the new model, mm -hmm. there is no requirement that any release right. has a signature feature, right? There you, go. you could have one gem. Theoretically, although likely, you could have no gems. Well, no, that's not going to happen. But <laughs> you could have a release on which the only difference is, oh, new Unicode version, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's fine. That's OK, right? Uh, JDK 11, same idea, mm -hmm. 17 gems, right? And Again, nothing that was added in the list of features was removed. It just gets added later. Right. What does that mean for future? Right. So beyond Java 11, if you look at JDK 12, we currently have four JEPs targeted. Mm -hmm. That's so far. If you go back to this page and look at it in December, there may be five or 10, right? Those four are not likely to be dropped. But it is possible that we will add some more, OK? So this means I no longer have a multi-year uh, roadmap for, hey, here's what we think will come out in Java in 2023. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We know a few months before. And no. it's locked down basically with the candidate phase, right? Release uh, candidate, like so. Release candidate so phase, right. yes. So that's, where that's, when that's when we build what we think will be right. the, the final version, right? Now, there's a couple of other interesting implications on this one, mostly about the quality of the features and where do you get to play with it. Because in the past, mm -hmm. if you wanted to play with a new feature, you would get the EA, say, of Java 9, sometimes years ahead of time, and you would start playing with those features and providing feedback, mm -hmm. right? Now that we don't have that EA, where do you play with those new features? Because you know, features are going to be created in separate projects. And only when they're ready will they be added. But in order for them to be ready, they need to receive some feedback from the community. Right. So how do I try that? Now we have early accesses for projects, not just for major releases. OK? That's important. Yeah. That's important. So what's the next set of projects, right? right. As I said, it, we don't, so we don't so know we which features are going out, but we can tell you what projects we're working on. Right. Uh. And the j just to finish, the JDK 12, so all the features in the JDK 12, w w uh, there is an early access already available. Absolutely. And you can, uh, as features are added, you can actually download and test the Correct. features. Correct. Right. And the early access is, uh, you know, now we've, for JDK 11, th what we had as the early access a month before GA, that mm -hmm. was the release candidate. That was the same binary. Right. That's what made it to GA. Right. So, you know, it's pretty stable, right? So uh, the next big challenges or opportunities, depending on how you want to look at them, right? Containers. Yep. Um, increasing the predictability, especially in regards to garbage collection, which mm -hmm. is sort of unpredictable if you use the defaults. Mm -hmm. Improve the performance. Uh, that optimization. Um, JDK has been fantastic in optimizing, in optimizing uh, code. We want to make it better in optimizing also how data is represented in memory. Uh, take advantage of increasing hardware acceleration, mm -hmm. uh, improve scalability, and of course, continue to make the language easier to use for developers and increase productivity. So these are some of the projects mm -hmm. that we've been working on or that are actually being worked on right now. Right. I'll just give you a quick overview of a few of them. So Project Portola, this is creating a port of the JDK so that it works on Alpine Linux, which is a very small, uh, is, is a distribution of Linux that has a very small footprint. And it's widely used in containers. So if you want to duplicate uh, an instance, and you know, since you're bringing along the operating system, you want to bring as, as little of an operating system as possible. Mm -hmm. So you know, Portola, hopefully it'll get us there. Next one, Project Valhalla. This is what we talked about having a representation in, in memory that it's more efficient. Right now, sometimes you have a, a class, which is just a container for data. But the way that Java treats all objects is you know, they all have identity. And that means that in memory, you will have a header for the object and then the object underneath. In reality, in this, you know, in this particular example, perhaps what we really wanted was to have in memory just a bunch of x and y's, right? 
So it's th the tag line, you know, one of the many, codes like a class, works like an integer. So it has mm -hmm. the performance of the primitive, but the flexibility of a class. Okay? Yep. Project Panama, uh, it's uh, proposing a revamp of JNI so that you can have uh, access to uh, native class, native memory, you know, native access to memory, <laughs> and you can uh, use other languages, non Java, in your programs as well. And it's trying to make that integration, you know, right now you have JNI and that you can do it, but it's kind of cumbersome. Projects, uh, does it need to be like fully completed before it, and it, it gets into the JDK? Or, or what happens if like maybe part of it or the situation changes? Uh, that's a good question. A project will not, uh, might will not necessarily come in as one JEP. Mm -hmm. A project might have many JEPs that spin out of it, if you will. It can also be delivered in different parts. Perhaps there'll be some improvement in the JVM, then perhaps some change in some libraries to take advantage of the and so one of these projects may father, I don't know, 15, 20 jabs. And it's not like, oh, when Lumit's done, you'll receive this massive right. change in the JDK. Uh, that's what we would have done before. Now we try to give you the change in bite-sized pieces, right? And mostly because there's some lot of benefit that we want to put in your hands, even before we have completed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, So it does. we do have a couple of examples of that. Okay. So Project Loom, yep. it's trying to make, um, uh, instead of having, it's, it's trying to make a, concur a concurrency model that will be much cheaper to use. So it's trying to use millions of fibers almost free without any cost. Okay. Okay. Project Amber, and here's an example of that. It's trying to address some of the pain points for all t with the verbosity of Java. And as an example, Project Amber already produced uh, the var keyword that we used in you know local type inference in JDK 10. And raw string literals and switch expressions are two jets that are as, they're listed as preview features for JDK 12. Mm -hmm. So um, raw string literals will allow you to uh, write a string, for example, right now if I wanted to write some HTML in my code, I would have to concatenate and I would have to put the new character as escape character, right? With raw string literal, I use a backtick and everything b until the next backtick, it's just considered everything, including the, the, the spaces, the carriage returns, um, everything is just considered part of the string, okay? Uh, if your string happens to have a backtick, then all you have to do is have two backticks be that delimiter. And then your string can contain one backtick. And it's the two backticks at the end that will close the string. Make okay. sense? Yep. And switch expressions. We've seen a lot of code where developers use a switch statement. Mm -hmm. And what they're trying to do is assign some value to a variable based on the result of that statement, right? And this is very error prone. What happens if I forget the break? You know, I have to create this default. Um, a switch expression will allow me to use a switch in a more natural way for this purpose, and it'll just return the value. Switch on the case, all of these, return six, you know, return seven. And these are, uh, you know, result that of Project Amber. Mm -hmm. So we're not done with Project Amber, but to your point, right. there it is. JDK 12 will have some of these benefits, even though we're not done. Uh, Project SCARA, um, we're looking into migrating. This is mostly for the OpenJDK contributors. Mm -hmm. This is migrating from Mercurial to something like Git. Yep. And, you know, uh, as an end user of the JDK, you may not notice this, but for uh, the OpenJDK contributors, right. this is a big deal. And as I mentioned, that means now that on early access, you shouldn't just go and grab an early access of the next major version, right? right? Well, the next feature version. You should now go, and if you're interested in what's going on with um, Panama or Valhalla, we have early access for those projects. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when we've gotten to we're done, we will just say, you know, here's the last piece of Valhalla that needs to go into a release. Then we'll make do without that early access. It'll just go to JDK. I don't know. Saying a number here, don't hold me to it. 27, right? And right. that'll be it. No more early access for Valhalla. 
And that's it, that's what that's I wanted it. to tell you. I mean, those are some of the changes that have arrived to the in GDK the in the yeah. last uh, 14, 15 months.